Okay, uh, let's get started on uh, this wonderful May Day and uh, for the last uh, lecture of our Social Sciences Education Lecture season. And uh, my name is Nina Rosenstein and I teach philosophy here and I chair the series. I'm most of you have before I can know that. So I am very happy to uh, be able to welcome our speaker who is a lecturer here at Mesa, a lecturer in history. And this is Rob Bond, who is an expert in Middle Eastern history and right now he's doing research on the Ottoman Empire. Uh, but today's topic is not back in time. Well, it probably combines <laughs> past and present and future because it is revolutions in the Arab world, causes and prospects for the future, which may be the most timely uh, of all the talks here in this room. So, welcome, Rob. Thank you. Um, for those who, uh, possibly who uh, had seen an earlier announcement, I was going to be talking today on Islamist uh, movements. Uh, but rather than do that, uh, I thought, well, the last five months in the Middle East have been a little, uh, had a few events going on. So I thought rather than uh, talking about Islamist movements, I would rather look at uh, the revolutions that have been going on in the Middle East. We can also talk a little bit later on whether they are revolutions or not. Uh, and so maybe somebody would like to ask that in the future. But we're going to look at um, the, um, what, what, what's been going on in the Middle East. So we're going to look at these uprisings that have been going across the uh, Arab world. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the, uh, the background, what caused these uh, events to happen. So we'll look at some of the causes. Then we'll look at specific events uh, around the Arab world. And finally, we'll finish up and I'll talk a little bit about what might happen or what, uh, what are some of the prospects for the future in um, the Middle East and North Africa. So uh, I think it's good to start off where it all started, and that was in Tunisia. Uh, back in uh, December, uh, uh, back in December is, is when all of these events started to happen. In about mid-December, uh, we had an individual named Mohamed Bouazizi. Uh, Mohammed Bouazizi was a um, man who uh, was a fruit seller in Tunisia, in a city uh, outside of Tunis. And Mohammed Bouazizi sold fruits illegally uh, on the side of the street to make a living for his family and for his mother. And uh, on the day, on one day in December, uh, he got some really great collection of vegetables he had bought on a wholesale market. And he was just so excited, I'm going to go sell these. And I know they'll give me a really great price, and then I'll come home. And he told his mom as he was leaving, I'm going to buy you something nice. I'm going to buy you a present. And so on his way to go sell these vegetables, the local police stopped him and said, do you have a license to sell these vegetables? And they, he said no. And he'd always been sort of around law and everything. But in this case, they decided to take his cart away from him and all his vegetables. The police did this often. And uh, it was a very corrupt society in that the police just loved to take whatever they liked from fruit sellers. There was no, you know, you couldn't tell them no. So they would always help themselves to the best things, and that's probably why they took his card in the first place. They wanted his vegetables. Uh, when he went to complain about this and went to try to get his card back because that was his only uh, avenue of living, um, he was insulted in public by a female police officer and slapped. Uh, and that in public was a very... Uh, shocking thing for him, for him uh, to happen to him in, uh, in, this, in this type of society. And then when he went to complain at the uh, police uh, headquarters, they just told him to go home. Sorry, we're, we, we we're not going to do anything for you. Well, he left and he went home and he decided, I am going to teach them a lesson. I am going to teach the country a lesson about what these people are doing and that they just discriminately do these things to people and ruin their lives. So he went home and he got a bottle of uh, turpentine and he went back to the police, in front of the police station, and he doused himself with it and he set himself alight. And uh, there's, a, there's a video was made by somebody's cell phone of this event and, um, and uh, quickly started to spread over social networks and what had happened started to spread throughout Tunisia. Uh, he was taken to the hospital, uh, but it was already uh, too late for the, for the authorities because people started to go out into the streets in his own hometown. People started to protest corruption. 
they started to protest against this arbitrary, um, the arbitrariness of the police department and uh, how brutally they treated their own people. They started to protest about food prices and how they couldn't make livings. And uh, a few hundred people came out in his own town. Then thousands started to come out uh, throughout Tunisia. Um, <clears throat> the president of Tunisia had been in power for over 20 years. His name is, was President Ben Ali. Uh, he's now the former president. And uh, President Ben Ali had, uh, was a military man, and he had come to power through a military coup. And he had created a pretty authoritarian state in Tunisia. He did not allow for, uh, he did not allow for any political dissent, and uh, he had a pretty corrupt regime which supported uh, him, his family members, and uh, sort of these elite pa uh, groups around him. So uh, rebellion broke out in, the, in major cities. People began to protest against all the abuses the government had been doing. Um, ben Ali. Uh, used force at first. He tried to put the police out, he brought the army out, he tried to intimidate, but the people kept coming out. They contacted one another through social networks, through traditional networks, and uh, various groups started to protest, all with their own uh, ideas about what the kind of future that should be. But they all agreed that this guy's regime should go, and that they needed to have rule of law and a constitution and an elected government, not just what Ben Ali said. Now, Ben Ali tried to make things right. He actually, and you can see here, he showed up to the hospital. That's Mohammed Wazizi in the hospital bed there. And he came to show his respects and he, that he felt sorry for, you know, for what happened to him. And he promised to look into the affair. The policewoman who slapped him was fired. Um, but you can see more people are kind of more interested in Ben Ali talking there uh, than in the, the patient. Uh, just right after this happened, just to give you an idea, uh, the, uh, Ben Ali gave uh, Bouazizi's mom a check for $14,000 in front of the cameras. And so he, you know, he said, uh, you know, I'm sorry, hopefully this will make things a little bit better. As soon as the cameras were turned off and she started to walk away, one of Bu uh, Ben Ali's assistants came and took the check out of her hand. He said, oh, no, we're keeping that. So it gives you an idea about the, how corrupt this regime really is. The, uh, over a 30-day period, people kept coming out and coming out and coming out to the streets, protesting Ben Ali's government. Uh, and uh, violence did happen. Over 140 people by the uh, time Ben Ali left died uh, as a result of the exuberance of police forces and the military. But in the end, the people around Ben Ali decided that there needed to be change, that Ben Ali was a dispendable authoritarian, and that if we just get rid of the guy at the top, well, the military is still here, our political party is still here, we're still here, and we'll just rearrange things, and we can keep what we have. And when Ben Ali found out that the military and that a lot of his closest confidants were not willing to support him anymore, he got on an airplane and left and uh, ended up going to Saudi Arabia. And this is what started a whole series of revolts throughout the Arab world, uh, which are continuing all the way up until this day. Now, when I talk about the Arab world today, I wanted to be sure to clarify I'm going to be talking about the Middle East and North Africa, because this is really the Arab world. These countries all the way from Morocco, all the way across over here to just before Iran, are all basically uh, Arab culturally. Uh, they speak Arabic as a major language. Um, there are other cultures live in these countries, but this is what we call the Arab world. So I'm going to use often the phrase MENA, which means Middle East and North Africa, as a geographical construct. Now, let's take a look at what are some of the causes. What, why were people so angry? Why were people willing to risk their lives uh, to go out and to protest against uh, Ben Ali's government? And then we'll see about all of these others. Because every single country you see here, there have been protests. Every single country here, there have been people killed uh, because they're fighting for a change in their political system. They're fighting for a change in um, the type of government they have and the type of economy they have. 
So we're going to look, talk probably about almost every one of these places. So let's look at some of these underlying causes first. First of all, probably the greatest problem facing all of these countries is high unemployment. High unemployment. Of all the regions in the world, uh, according to um, most economic indicators, the Middle East has the highest unemployment rate of all regions of the world. It averages a little uh, close to almost 10.5% right, for uh, possible employed people. So it, is, uh, it has the highest unemployment rate in, in the world. Some countries have much higher unemployment rates than others. For example, Yemen, as we'll see, has one-third of the population unemployed. Okay, one-third. Uh, some of the other countries, too, uh, have significant unemployment, and there's also significant differences between rural unemployment and uh, urban unemployment. Rural unemployment is even higher. Finally, one of the driving forces between all, one of the driving forces behind all of these revolts have been the youth. They have been the ones that have been out in the streets uh, in larger numbers than anybody else. And you can see why, because they don't see that they have a future, because they suffer from even worse unemployment. And as you can see here, these are all countries that have had significant revolts in them, um, except Algeria. Algeria has had a whole bunch of demonstrations, but it hasn't seriously threatened the government yet. But Yemen, Tunisia, you can see that all of the unemployment rate, and these are youths under 21 uh, or under 25 years of age, uh, you can see that unemployment for them is between 20 and 25 percent. These countries are all young. Um, if you take MENA together, it equals about 350 million people. Half of those are under the eight, are 25 and under, okay, which has a significant impact. Uh, if you look at Algeria, for example, here, Algeria, 75% of the population is under 30, which these people are coming, they're, they're finishing their education or they're uh, looking for jobs and they're just not there. And it's causing tremendous frustration. So unemployment is probably one of the greatest causes of these revolts. There's just no opportunities for people. Poverty is yet another reason why these people are going out in the streets. There's tremendous poverty in, in the Middle East. Uh, even, even in countries that produce oil. You might be shocked to know that some of the countries, we call these countries that produce oil, they're called rentier states, or states that make money um, out of resources and they don't have to tax their population. Um, these resources are basically very easy to get and it's just almost free money. Even these countries that produce oil uh, have significant problems with rural poverty, uh, which is hard to imagine, but they, we'll see why. So there's significant poverty in, in almost all of these countries. Uh, to give you an idea, uh, about 43% of the Middle East of working people live on $2 or less a day. 43%. In North Africa, it's a little bit less. It's around 32, 33%. So people are barely getting by. People ha do not have enough to even eat half the time. So poverty is another major cause for these revolts. And that leads me to number three, which is one of the, another one of the major uh, reasons why we see revolts in the Middle East today. And when you see a lot of these protesters, if you look online and look at uh, in pictures of crowds of protesters in the Middle East, in Egypt, or in uh, Tunisia, or in, this is, in, this is from uh, Egypt, and in, um, in Syria, I'll show you another picture in Syria, a lot of them are all holding bread. Why are they doing that? It doesn't make a really good weapon, does it? Uh, to protect yourself. What, they're holding that because the price of bread has gone up tremendously over the last few years because global commodity prices have shot through the roof. Food prices uh, has just uh, impacted these people tremendously because their disposable income is all going toward food, is all going toward housing. If you combine food and housing, for the majority of the people in Egypt, for example, that's taking up 80% of what they earn, even more. Libya, with youth unemployment, has, is a very high youth unemployment rate. 
Um, that's one of the reasons why there, there have been a lot of revolts uh, there as well. Um, and with consumer price inflation too, uh, the Libyan government basically does the same as almost all these other governments, and that is that they subsidize food prices. And so um, they would figure in pretty high on price inflation as well. So um, I wanted to talk just briefly more about food prices because it's, it's a very interesting topic. Um, most of these Middle Eastern countries are authoritarian regimes, as we'll see. Most of these authoritarian regimes um, don't allow for democracy, don't allow for any personal freedoms. Um, life is very hard economically. And so most of these authoritarian regimes, to try to keep their people happy, subsidize food. They subsidize food. Egypt does that. All, every single country here actually does it. They spend money to make bread, cooking oil, rice, whatever it is, more affordable for the general population. Um, and this is sort of this is buying, you know, people's support, right? By making things cheaper, if they're at least filling their stomachs, they're not going to revolt. But now these governments all are backing away from their subsidies because commodity prices have got so have gotten so expensive that they just can't afford to do it anymore. And so they're having to allow the prices to rise on all the basic food products, just like bread. Now, I thought I'd give you an example from Egypt about these subsidies. Uh, Egypt was taken over, uh, well, the, the monarchy was ended in the 1950s, and uh, Gamal Abdel Nasser, a military man, uh, eventually became the president and de facto ruler of Egypt and instituted an authoritarian regime in Egypt. Uh, that regime uh, started this whole policy of subsidizing food prices. They started to make all these commodities cheaper and cheaper. In 1960, Egypt was still feeding its own population. It still produced enough wheat to feed its own population. But on the international market, wheat was so cheap in the 1960s, 1970s, and even in the 1980s that they could afford to buy wheat cheaper on the international market than to grow it. And the government started to buy wheat on the international market and not really subsidize or not really help uh, the agricultural economy of Egypt. And so Egypt's agricultural sector started to decline because they weren't being invested in. And instead, they were buying cheap food internationally. By the 1970s and 1980s, Egypt was importing half of its food. It was importing half of its food. It was spending, on average, about $3 billion a year on wheat, and Egypt became the largest wheat importer in the entire world. Of the top 20 wheat importers even today, 10 of them come from the Middle East. And of course, that's kind of naturally, they, a lot of Middle Eastern countries don't have agricultural sectors to make that much wheat. But they uh, import just tremendous amounts of food to keep their populations happy. And this puts a strain on their budget. For Egypt's case, uh, today, just uh, what in the last figures I saw, 19 or 2009, 2010, Egypt was spending, if you include education and healthcare, along with the food subsidies, they were 43% uh, of their entire budget was going towards subsidies. And it's just not something sustainable for these economies. And so as food prices globally and wheat prices started just going up and up. Corn prices, of course, especially the United States, using a lot more corn for ethanol and other products. Um, as the prices for corn and, and wheat and everything went up, they had to start to raise prices because they could not afford to keep that going. And that's what led to these revolts because people couldn't eat anymore. They couldn't afford to buy bread. They couldn't afford cooking oil and rice and everything else that they need just for a basic or it was just eating up all their income. Unemployment rates in the countryside tend to be much higher than in the cities uh, as a percentage. Of course, there are more unemployed in cities. Uh, and then when it comes to food, uh, people who are in the, uh, in, in the agricultural, they have more access to food, of course. Uh, unfortunately, in, in Egypt, for example, which does have the capability uh, to feed itself again, 
they just don't spend the money on that because they're spending too much on, on doing this. Keeping the people, needing to keep the people happy, needing to, to pay for subsidies. I saw this in Tur when I lived in Turkey, even Turkey, which has a very open economy and got rid of most subsidies, they still pay subsidies on one thing, and that was bread. You could go and buy, they called it people's bread, and it was 10 cents a loaf for a baguette like that guy's holding. And so there was always that little something that was there, uh, sort of a, at the uh, you know, just some kind of basic sustainable level that, uh, that they, would, they would do. But this is something that is really affecting all these countries because they can't afford it. Now, some can. Um, Saudi Arabia, for example, um, they, they have the oil money that they can spend to continue to do this and to pay more and more for these, these, these commodities. But countries that are strapped, that are not oil producers, um, like Yemen, Yemen doesn't produce enough oil uh, compared to Saudi Arabia, or uh, Algeria, or Jordan, or Egypt, they don't have the money to continue to spend for these, these places. Politically, also, there are causes for these, uh, for these revolts, politically. Um, almost all of these regimes, in one way or another, are authoritarian. Whether the ruler calls himself a king, or a president, or a prime minister, um, there are almost all these regimes in the Middle East and North Africa are authoritarian in one way or another. No, not all of them, but most of them. Uh, authoritarian regimes came in in the 1950s. There, uh, the the uh, Egypt under Nasser became an authoritarian regime. Uh, Nasser's successor Sadat uh, in the 1970s up until his assassination in the 80s. He uh, he. Uh, you know, had an authoritarian regime, and of course Mubarak, his successor, had a, an authoritarian regime, all under the same political uh, party. Um, in Syria and in Iraq in the 1950s through the 1980s, authoritarian regimes were instilled there under the Ba'ath Party um, and with cooperation or with the aid of the military. So, for example, in, in Syria, Syria today is controlled by the Assad family, the Al-Assad family. And they uh, have close ties with the military and with the Ba'ath Party, and it's an authoritarian regime. Uh, up until recently, Iraq was under an authoritarian regime that was a, a combination of the military uh, and the Ba'ath Party under Saddam Hussein. Um, now it's an authoritarian regime under uh, Shia uh, politicians and, and Kurds up in the north. Uh, so authoritarianism uh, exists still, uh, or exists in much of the world. Now, these authoritarian regimes, we see a total absence, really, of the uh, general rule of law in these countries. Um, courts are often very corrupt. Judges can be bought off. They don't follow, follow the rule of law. Um, there's no due process in the legal system. Uh, there's arbitrary arrests. People can be put in jail for, for basically forever in many of these places or made to disappear. Um, so there's really no, no real, uh, uh, there's a no rule of law. Uh, most of these countries have very limited uh, access to freedom of speech or no freedom of speech at all. Uh, newspapers are, um, are um, censored. The TV, uh, television, and internet are controlled uh, in, in some of these countries, though um, there are many people now are very creative and are around, uh, able to get around these blocks on the internet, for example, like Syria puts in. Uh, Syria, for years, allowed the internet. They even had internet cafes, but you could just go to you know, Syrian websites and, you know, and certain websites, and then they wouldn't let you go anywhere else. So um, there are ways that people have been able to get around that. But for the most part, people do not have uh, any avenue for freedom of speech, no freedom of press. They cannot um, gather in groups like they're doing now um, in the past. And so there's no freedom. Also, the military uh, is very dear to these authoritarian regimes because they need to hold on to power. And the main tool for them to get rid of any dissent is the military or paramilitary groups or police. And all of these regimes have thousands and thousands of them, all right? Um, with the exception, actually, of Libya, which had, does, his, Muammar Gaddafi actually does, did not have a very large army, but he did have large paramilitary, he does have large paramilitary forces. But in the, for the most part, 
um, the military uh, plays a very important role in eliminating dissent. Another major, uh, another major uh, cause for these revolts is corruption. These regimes are extremely corrupt. For the most part, what you have in these regimes is you have an authoritarian leader or authoritarian party system at the top, like the Ba'ath Party, and they control all the resources. They control access to all the resources. And what you see emerging in these states are sophisticated systems of clientage below these regimes. They do this in order to control the population. They'll give money to one group. Here you go. Here are some resources. And that way they can play one group off another by giving them favors. The regimes generally um, use economic resources as a tool for social control. So you have these elaborate networks of people who have lots of resources, you know, the people at the top who control the resources, giving resources in a clientage system or patronage system down below. This goes all the way back, actually, even to the Ottoman period, where in government you had sophisticated networks of patronage as well. So it's not something new in the Middle East. Um, corruption is extremely rampant, extremely rampant. If you're in the government, um, you need to have patrons who will get you up to higher positions. You need to um, have, develop your own clientage system. You take payments from people, uh, give those on. Um, if you are in the public sector uh, or in the private sector and you want to get a government contract, you have to know the right people to get a contract. You have to pay them off. So there's sophisticated levels of corruption uh, in all of these countries. And if you look at the corruption index here uh, on this chart, you can see um, here's the corruption index for some of these countries. <clears throat> The highest and most corrupt place in the world right now is Somalia, with a, a rating of 178. Not too far behind that, at about 158, is uh, Iraq, which isn't on the list, on this list. Um, and then you can see, look at Libya, 146. Yemen, a very corrupt place, 146. Iran. Uh, to give you an idea, the United States on the corruption index is about 53. And uh, I think the least corrupt place in the world, according to um, the corruption index, which is done, uh, there's a center that uses questionnaires and does research to determine these ratings, uh, is um, Denmark, 30. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> so that, that's probably the least corrupt place uh, in, in the world. And, and that gives you a, an idea. Uh, about uh, corruption. So corruption, uh, people have to live with this each and every day. They have to deal with po corrupt police. They have to deal with corrupt officials. And all of these people, you have to pay or you have to know the right people, and it's extremely frustrating just to live, just to get by, just to, to do anything. Um, in Turkey, Turkey is um, around the 120 level to 100, uh, yeah, 120, I think it was last, 123. <coughs> Uh, when I lived in Turkey, I knew some business people from the United States who were lawyers who did contracts and everything. That country, um, many of these lawyers, after a year of trying to figure out who they had to pay off or who they had to work with or who had to take out to dinner or whatever, they just gave up. They just, this is just, they couldn't handle the corruption there. And they just, they just left. Uh, and said, you know, find somebody else to do this. I'm not, I'm not doing this anymore. Um, so these regimes have uh, significant issues with corruption. Finally, I think probably in the perception of these people who are going out into the streets and revolting, they generally see that they have put their trust in government, uh, these governments, these authoritarian regimes who promised them the world, who promised them uh, a better life, who promised them housing and cheap food, and they see that these people have basically failed to meet their needs. And they feel stifled. They feel smothered by the bureaucracy, and they can't say anything about it because then they'll go see the inside of a jail cell. They'll be beaten. They'll be you know, thrown somewhere and, and the key's gone. 
So there's just this general frustration. It's been building up and building up and building up. And it, it, it's not new that there haven't been revolts in the Middle East. There have been revolts throughout the last, you know, since these countries have all had their independence after World War II. They have suffered from revolts off and on. Um, but for them all to break out uh, now at once and with so many people, hundreds of thousands, tens of thousands of people going out into the streets and holding, it's something completely new because these people have just had enough and they don't mind dying for maybe getting some kind of change. And Tunisia started all of this because they saw that Ben Ali left after a month. And Tunisia, uh, the politicians are promising a new constitution. They're going to have elections for a, a constituent assembly, which will write a new constitution. And then new elections. And Ben Ali and his family are being investigated. And they're being charged for, the, for crimes against their state, for ordering the military to shoot and kill 140 or 130 or 140 of their own people. So once people saw that happen, revolts started to break out in other places. So I'm going to just go through some of these and just talk a little bit about each of them. Um, in the time that I have left, and then uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the prospects for the future. These are some other, these are just two other quick causes. Uh, one other quick cause are regional, tribal, and religious differences. In many countries, um, there are splits between um, various groups. Okay? And um, in some of these countries, uh, these revolts are also driven by these differences. Uh, in Libya, for example, uh, there's distinct differences between tribal groups in the east and the west, and that has led to revolts. In Bahrain, there's a religious difference. A majority of the population is Shia, 65%, but the ruling class is Sunni, and they do not give the Shia any political say, or almost none. And um, in Bahrain, they also have very little access to jobs and to advancement. So that one's generate, that's generated by uh, religious differences. In Iraq, again, religious and, um, and regional differences okay? uh, between Shia and Sunni and Kurd and Arab. Yemen, significant tribal differences uh, with the north and the south and differences in ideology as well have driven that one. So those are some other causes as well. Finally. One thing that's being made out a lot in the in these um, in these uh, in the uh, in the press is that uh, is this a revolution that's being driven by Facebook? I think Facebook would love to claim that and, and be great advertising for them. Um, and indeed, Facebook and social media have played a very important role in many of these Middle Eastern countries in organizing people, especially the youth who are savvy um, with you know cell phones. Um, and so, indeed, Facebook and Twitter and other uh, social network systems have played roles in organizing people to a certain degree. But it's also important to note that uh, there are other traditional networks that are very important for these revolts, and they're probably more important than these. Also, uh, traditional media like Al Jazeera uh, have played a role in bringing information to people, especially people with satellite dishes. And even just the technology, of, the plain technology of cell phones. Okay? Uh, cell phones, I think, even play a bigger role in some ways if for people who don't have access to Facebook or Twitter, but they can email people, or call people, or send, you know, send messages. Um, the cell phone has played a tremendous role. So uh, there is something to be said that these revolutions have been uh, aided by social media, but it's probably been overemphasized, and probably Facebook likes that. Um, <clears throat> that they cause these revolts. This is just one page. This is, a, this is one that's really interesting. It's called We're All Khaled Saeed. Khaled Saeed was a, um, a man in southern Egypt, uh, no, I'm sorry, northern Egypt at the, near the, um, where the Nile comes out. And one day he noticed the police um, doing a drug bust and then deciding to keep all of the pot themselves. Surprise, surprise. And he got it on his cell phone. And then he started to transmit that, and the police took, it, uh, took an offense to that, and they found him after he had spread this information, and um, they beat him to death. And then they shoved hot down his throat and said, oh, he was you know, smuggling. And so this page 
was dedicated to him by uh, a one of the uh, a leading revolutionary actually in in Egypt uh, who works actually for Google. And this is a whole page that, if you go through it, it's all reports about abuses by the police, by Egyptian police on the people. Okay? If you have a squeamish stomach, it's, there's some things not to see on this page because they take pictures. But uh, it's, it's, this, is the way, this is the way that people learn. This is the, play, the way that people get angry and they have access to these things. Let's take a look at this Arab awakening, or as the press also likes to call it, the Arab Spring harkening back to Eastern Europe, I guess. Again, we'll, we'll look at some of these revolts, and, and then I'll open up for questions uh, after I talk about some of the prospects. On, on January 25th, um, there had been some, some um, demonstrations, but they were not very large. But on January 25th, uh, people using social media, using traditional networks, uh, organized a huge march on the major square uh, Tahrir, which means Liberation Square. Um, and the people refused to leave. They started to set up tents, and they, they stayed here, and they said, Mubarak, you have to leave. Remember, this was an authoritarian regime. The people were suffering under high food prices, corruption, um, nowhere, uh, no in, no, nowhere jobs. There are lots of people who had very good educations who couldn't use their education. Um, often they were given government jobs and paid like five dollars a week, uh, because in this country, interestingly enough, if you get a, a degree in a college, you're guaranteed a government job. But what kind of job is it? Well, maybe you get to you know lick stamps and put it on the envelope for five dollars a week, um, which causes a lot of frustration because these people can't get jobs for what they're trained for, and then they go into these really bad jobs. They can't eat, they can barely afford food, and they can't even afford a place to live. Um, and of course, to have a family in Egypt, you have to have a place to take your wife. You can't get married and say, we're going to stay with mom and dad. It doesn't work in Egypt. So um, <clears throat> there's lots of frustration here. Corruption, the police, as I just described about what they did to that poor individual in, in, um, in the Nile Delta region. So they took to the streets. They started to put pressure on the government. Um, Mubarak react, uh, reacted by uh, saying, OK, OK. Um, he sent in the uh, he sent in the police. And he tried to use intimidation and violence at first. People died in large numbers. Uh, the military he brought in, but the military he didn't send in to do uh, to do anything yet. Um, <clears throat> the pressure continued and continued. He thought about sending the military in, according to what we know, and the military said no. And Mubarak, who came from the military. He was an Air Force uh, general. All of a sudden, one of the main supports was telling him no. One of his main supports for his regime was telling him no. And so then he said, OK, I'll, I'll leave. And then he tried to uh, placate the people by giving them cheaper food again, and by doing a whole bunch of other things. But they wouldn't take a no for an answer. They continued to stay out in the streets. And the military didn't do anything. The military, just like in Tunisia, decided the guy at the top can go. We're still going to be here. Everybody needs us. And many of the politicians, even though their political party would get banned after this, many of the politicians said, OK, we'll go along with that. And so Mubarak, uh, after about uh, 18 days of protests and about 400 deaths, uh, Mubarak decided, uh, I'm going to step down. He's now under arrest along with his family. He's in a hospital. He's in his 80s, and he's, it was a little stressful for him, I guess. Um, and so the people won. The people got him to stand down, and the military stood in. And what's really interesting about Egypt is that the people believe that the army is on their side. This is one of the things that you heard in this square over and over and over again. The army and the people are one. We are together. They believe that the army is a dynamic group who will bring in change again. Much like Nasser brought in change when he took over the, uh, and kicked out the king in the 1950s, they see the army as doing the same thing again. So they put a lot of trust in the army. And after Mubarak left, the army, um, the army uh, said, OK, we're going to organize things. And the army uh, started to basically take over the political system. And they're the caretakers of the government, really at this period of time. 
Uh, now, protests have not stopped because there are some people from this group, uh, which represents a wide, you know, wide variety of people from the different um, from uh, from society. There are people who still don't trust the military, and so the military has um, cracked down on them. They finally did use force because they know that they have the upper hand, that they're going to be the arbiters and the makers of the new government. So what's really happening here is we have a military takeover. The military is saying we're going to create a new democracy here. They're going to have new elections in September, and they ban the old party, but it'll be interesting to see what goes on. Is the new old party going to come back as a new party? Are people who are favorites of the military going to you know, all of a sudden win and uh, become you know, the new president or whatever it might be? So uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens here. The next place revolts broke out was in Yemen. Uh, people inspired by Tunisia and Egypt um, started to take to the streets in Jan at the end of January. And especially in the major capital city of Sana'a, but other cities in southern uh, Yemen as well. Yemen was also a, a country with a very uh, dictatorial regime ruled by uh, President Ali Abdullah Saleh and his political party. That party, uh, it was pretty much a monolithic party, which uh, was very similar in, in stature to, uh, to Egypt. Yemen, though, had a lot of uh, particular problems, though. Saleh uh, was rule, had ruled since about 1990 when uh, Yemen had unified. Before 1990, there had been a northern and a southern Yemen, and they had unified. He was president of southern Yemen since 1978. Um, Yemen is a really difficult mix because in the north, you have a lot of Shia, and they have revolted, and they want to recreate a northern state. In the south, you have tribal groups, uh, some influenced by uh, socialism, who remember the socialist south that he was president of and want to bring that back again. Um, and then you have, uh, uh, you know, Al Qaeda there, uh, and other uh, uh, revolutionary Islamist groups uh, who want to destabilize the regime. So uh, Saleh has a real, he's you know, sitting on top of a boiling pot. You know, he's, he's really difficult for him and his decisions. And all of a sudden, this sort of this happened to him. These revolts broke out. He responded with violence as well. Uh, he put sharpshooters up on roofs and started to shoot into the crowd just indiscriminately. Um, but the people continue to come out into the streets in the major cities day after day after day in Sana'a. And um, gradually again as time wore on, um, his position was eroded as well. And power groups around him started to decide maybe he was, maybe could be gotten rid of as well. And so uh, the, one of his brother-in-laws, you always usually trust your family member, one of his brother-in-laws, who was a military commander, said, decided, I'm going to side with the rebels. I'm going to side with people in the streets. And some of his tribal groups who had supported him as well said, maybe we're, we're going to think about this. And here you can see, you can always tell a tribal, a member of the tribe, they, they dress in this distinctive way, and they have their, um, their, um, uh, their dagger, this kind of dagger, which is kind of a symbol of manhood. And all, all men have one of those, especially the tribal groups. It's also important to note that this country is extremely well armed. And um, this is one of the things that worries uh, Western, uh, Western um, diplomats, also people in Arabia, is that this country, if he goes, could fall into civil war. This is a country of 24 million people, and they estimate that there are 74 million weapons in this country. That's three for everybody. Um, having a Kalashnikov is a sign of manhood. It's even better to have than this thing. Just because they have to shoot far. Um, and so there's considerable, there's considerable tension here. Saleh um, was going to step down. He decided, you know, I'm losing all this support. I'm just going to do like what Ben Ali did, what Mubarak did. I'm going to go the same way. And he decided, I'm going to negotiate, though so that I can avoid prosecution and all my cronies will not get arrested. And so he negotiated a deal where he was going to leave as soon as within 30 days of him signing an agreement. 
After he made the agreement, he was supposed to go to Saudi Arabia to sign it, and he told Saudi Arabia, well, I'm, I'm not going to come. I'm afraid there's going to be a, a, a coup in my country. And then he started to make new demands. Well, we're going to change this and change that and change that. And so now he's changed his policy. He figures that he can hold on. He figures, as he saw in what happened in Bahrain, as we'll see, or what happens in the other countries, that maybe if he holds on, the people in the streets who are protesting will start to attack one another. Maybe the people protesting in the streets will get tired and go home, and that he can hold his position. So now he's holding out. There are many in the Middle East who want him to stay, actually, because he's, he, he is an, he's been a perceived element of stability. Saudi Arabia wouldn't mind having him stay, uh, stay there as, to be stable, because they don't want Yemen to blow up into a civil war. And I already talked about all the groups who could start a civil war. Okay? So there are many who want to. All right, uh, another, another place where uh, revolt broke out was Bahrain. Bahrain is an island in the Persian Gulf. It has some oil reserves. Uh, but they are quickly being depleted. Uh, in Bahrain, uh, revolts broke out on February 14th. As you can see here, people went to um, Pearl Square, or the Pearl Turnpike, where the cars all move around in the main city of Manama. Here, um, a majority of the people going out into the streets were Shia Muslims, who made up 65% of the population, um, yet who had no real political say in the government. The government was ruled, it was a constitutional monarchy ruled by um, a king, King Khalid, and, uh, or King Khalifa, I'm sorry. King Khalifa. Yeah, King Khalifa. He had been ruling since about 2001. And he, uh, he uh, disenfranchised the Shia population. They could not participate in government. They had no say. There were some Shia parties, but they were so small in the, gov in the, in the, in the government that they couldn't do anything. Uh, the Shia population did not get access to good jobs, uh, didn't have really great education as well, and they were frustrated. There was also an international element to this because Iran is mostly Shia. And Iran would love to see this place uh, destabilized and maybe a Shia government, which might be favorable to it, in position. King Khalid, uh, uh, Khalifa, really played that up. So they took to the streets. And about three weeks passed, and they kept coming into the streets and coming into the streets. King Khalifa uh, was really worried. What do I do? He uh, then took the unprecedented step of leaving his own country and went over to Saudi Arabia to talk to the king there. And the king there uh, told him, we'll support you. We can't see, uh, we want to see conservative monarchies, and we want to see you you continue in power. We don't want anything destabilizing, and we definitely don't want to see Shia running Bahrain. So he offered troops, and so did United Arab Emirates. And so the UAE and Saudi Arabia came into the country, and that freed up a lot of his own troops to crack down on the people in the square. They uh, rushed into the square. They killed many people, and uh, not as many compared to other places, about 40. Um, but they broke up this revolt. They forced the people back into their houses. They patrol the streets today. Um, they intimidate and put pressure on the Shia. Um, but these revolts are over, at least for now. And it looks, you know, for, for many, and this is what probably made Saleh think, maybe I can do this too, uh, in, in Yemen, is that the king won. The king did get his revenge here too. He got upset about this square. And so that's what he did to it. I'm not having any more square there for anybody. And uh, so now they're building all sorts of things to make it there. No people will be able to gather in large numbers. Of course, another place that broke out in revolt not too long after that was February 5th, uh, in February 15th. And that was the country ruled by the longest ruling um, um, authoritarian uh, ruler, uh, Muammar Gaddafi. Uh, he'd been in power since 1969. And he had ruled the country in this kind of quasi-Islam uh, Islam sort of slash uh, socialist type of approach to ruling his country. Again, he uh, was supported by certain tribes, mostly here in the West. And he favored them with most of the, a lot of his oil money going toward uh, building them housing, and building them uh, a better life, whereas he ignored uh, quite a bit the West. <clears throat> 
Uh, protests broke out here. Again, people were inspired by Tunisia and Egypt, and they took to the streets. And especially in the West, where um, there was high unemployment, where there was not a lot of opportunity, where the, the government wasn't building promised housing, where food prices were going up, and so he, uh, they took to the streets. But what happened here, shockingly enough, uh, is that Muammar Gaddafi, instead of trying to just weather it or to try to just sit and watch what was going on for a while, he just went all or nothing. And he called out his military, he called out his police, and he started to kill people. And so, um, so what eventually happened is that the protesters uh, said, you know, we need help. These people are, he's just killing us indiscriminately. And what happened was that some people did listen to their call for help. Members of the military did. Members of the military who felt that um, they had really not been supported that much by Qaddafi because he didn't want to have a strong military really anyways because he was afraid that they would take him over. Um, and that's why he used mercenaries because he knew if he paid these mercenaries $1,000 a day, which is the going price if you want to go work there, um, that, that you know, that they were more loyal. And so the military, many from the military actually sided with the rebels. And thus broke out a civil war. It's regional, west versus east. To, uh, Tripoli is his center of power where he has most of his, um, where his military units were, where his base of power is. And Benghazi is the center of power for the protesters, where they have tribal alliances there, and where uh, some of the army uh, defected to them and sided, uh, sided with them, and um, so uh, civil war broke out. Now the uh, rebels, quote unquote, were very poorly armed compared to Qaddafi's group, and so um, they started to suffer tremendously. And the international community got involved after that, and it's the only case so far that the international community has got involved because he made really great statements like this. Those who don't love me do not deserve to live. It will be hell for them. That's, that's, that sounds like a really great political slogan, right? So once the international community heard him sprouting things like this, they realized that he, he didn't care about these people. They'll just kill them all. He'll force them back. He'll force them into loving me again. Love me or kill me, or I'll kill you. So um, the international community stepped in and through a UN resolution 1973, said that a no-fly zone was going to be uh, enacted over, over Libya, and we will, uh, anybody, any aircraft that Libya flies will attack, because the aircraft were really uh, you know, making a one-sided affair. And then they attacked uh, units of, of Muammar Gaddafi's army to prevent them from the whole-scale massacre to try to even out the sides. So the international community, especially led by Britain and France, and the United States, but even more Britain and France, has been trying to even up the war so that the rebels have a chance uh, of, of overthrowing him, uh, eventually wearing him down, wearing down his mercenaries. Um, we'll have to see, because still, as we, we're speaking right now, it's, it's very much um, a back and a very fluid affair, and I really, it's, it's impossible right now. A lot of pundits are saying Qaddafi's days are numbered, but I, I'm not so sure about that. It might be much longer. Syria is another place uh, where we have um, uh, also uh, revolts breaking out. These started around March 18th. Um, the Assad regime, of course, was a very, is a very oppressive regime as well. Uh, the Assads come from a minority group in Syria called the Alawis. They are a Shia group, um, though some um, 12 or Shias don't recognize them and consider them heretical. But they come of a Shia group that is located in northern Syria. Traditionally, um, a majority of the population in Syria are Sunni. And traditionally, most of the Sunnis didn't like to participate in the military. They felt that being in the military was below them. And so who filled up the officer corps in the Syrian army in the 1950s and 1960s? Minorities. Especially because they had no economic opportunities no educational opportunities. Hafiz al-Assad, the father of the current ruler Bashar, um, was dirt poor. And his only way out, his only way that he could get an education was through the military. He went to a military academy and he rose up in the ranks of the Air Force. In Syria, the officer corps is predominantly led by 
Alawis and other minorities in the country. Um, the minorities in, in, in Syria maybe make up about 28 to 32 percent of the population, somewhere there, and I'm including Christians, um, Druze, and others. And this is their base for support. Uh, and this is why, um, well, well, I'll get to that in a second, but the Assad regime, as it came in in the 1970s, created a very authoritarian regime. There was no dissent. There was, uh, he created a very strong paramilitary uh, organization, a military organization led by people who were loyal to him, his relatives. <laughs> it's always pretty good. And they uh, used oppression uh, to keep any political dissent down. People disappeared. People spent time in jail. Um, there was uh, very little uh, allowing for any kind of political freedoms there. Um, also, the Assad regime uh, had this very, uh, very, uh, it's very corrupt. They have very strict um, patterns of clientage, which didn't benefit a majority of the population, the Sunni population, and they really resented that. The Sunnis earlier, uh, 20 years ago, actually did revolt against Assad because of these issues, because of corruption, because of the atmosphere they lived in. Um, and they were organized and led at that time by the Muslim Brotherhood, which is since banned, and if you're a member of it in Syria right now, and they were to find out, that's a death sentence. Um, but in, 19, in the 1980s, they led a revolt against Father here. And Father responded by um, surrounding one of the major towns of their revolt, which was called Hama, and he probably killed about 20,000 people. He just leveled part of the whole city. His brother actually did. And this was a statement, you know, don't revolt against me or this is going to happen to you. One of the great writers or observers of Middle Eastern history, uh, Middle Eastern, modern Middle Eastern politics, a guy named Thomas Friedman, he wrote a great book called, called From Beirut to Jerusalem. He calls this Hama rules. This is the kind of rules that authoritarian regimes um, use. Violence. Saddam Hussein, same thing. Kurds were revolting. He, in 1988, did what was, he conducted what was called the Unfall, which resulted in the deaths of maybe 50 to 150,000 Kurds in northern Iraq because they were going to revolt. So that's how these kind of regimes uh, operate. Um, and so the uh, people, though, again, had enough of this. They had enough of the corruption. They had enough of the higher food prices. They had enough, and you can see here, what are they all holding up here? Yeah, they're holding up uh, a flat thread, right? This is, again, we, we won't take these high prices anymore. Okay? This is in Banyas, which the city since has been surrounded by the army. Um, so uh, demonstrations broke out. Okay? It all started in the town of Dera, when the local governor of Dera, the local Baathist governor there, uh, treated the local tribal uh, leaders with total contempt. When um, there was a disagreement about releasing some political prisoners, um, the tribal sheikhs came to the governor's house in Dara, or governor's office in Dara, and when they do an agreement, the leader takes off his turban and puts it on the table as a sign of respect. The Ba'athist gover governor took the turban and threw it on the ground and stepped on it. And it's right after that, of course, they left. And they were tribal sheikhs, so they, they were leaders of their community. So what did they tell the community to do? Go out into the streets. And the governor reacted by telling the army, or his police force, open fire. And three people were killed on March 18th. And then it just all exploded. All over Syria, people started to come out. Again, social media played a really big role. I've been looking at some of the social media sites that I can read. And, um, and they're really well organized through Facebook, again, through uh, Twitter, and through other networks using cell phones, they are organizing these revolts. Traditional, uh, traditional lines of organization have also been bringing people in the streets. Assad has reacted. Um, he at first reacted, and let's be nice. Let's try to give them what they want. He gave government employees raises. He lowered the prices of food. He decided to lift the state of emergency that had been in the country since the 1960s. Instead, 
the people, and, and, and after all these nice gestures, at least in his mind, um, the people still went out into the streets. So he decided to do what Dad did. I'll play by Hama rules. And so now he's called out the military, and they've gone in, and they've been killing tremendous amounts of people. They, um, and so far, at least we know, between 600 and 1,000 people have been killed. The army has been shooting indiscriminately at people, um, and then there's been mass arrests, uh, arrests as well as they're trying to, pull, uh, to stop this. So a couple thousand people have been put in jail as well. Um, many are actually afraid that this might break into a communal conflict between the minorities of the country, the Christians, um, the Alawis, who have, uh, or minorities who are worried that if the Sunnis come to power, that bad things will happen to them. And since this government favors those people, they don't want to see him go. And the military is very loyal. There's been very few cases of the military revolting or turning sides. So we'll see what happens there. Just a, a few other places quickly. Um, Oman, there were revolts in, this, in, the, uh, in some of the cities. People demonstrated against the government, which is ruled by uh, King Qaboos. Um, they got so angry they even burned a shopping mall down. He reacted by throwing money at the people. He gave them all payments and he raised, uh, raised uh, salaries. And then he also gave um, um, more money to subsidies. And that's quieted down there. Saudi Arabia, king, uh, the king announced $32 billion worth of subsidies and other gifts to the people, including a one-time payment of almost $3,000 just for you know, here. Um, and that, that's kind of kept things quiet. King of Jordan faced uh, uh, um, protests as well, and there, uh, there the king uh, sacked his government and is trying just by sacking his government to try to weather the storm. Algeria, people have been going out in the streets in Algiers, protesting especially food prices and wanting a change of government. Um, the government has responded with threats of force, uh, of, of violence. Uh, I just saw there was a demonstration, 10,000 demonstrators, 30,000 riot police. So that's just, you know, that's intimidation. Morocco, they're putting pressure on the king. They don't want to get rid of the king, but they want, to replay, uh, they want the king to replace his government and to um, open up the economy more. Um, where else? Iran, demonstrations, much from uh, similar to the Green Revolution when um, when there were, uh, in the last elections, when there were uh, demonstrations against Ahmadinejad. So, um, all throughout the Middle East and North Africa, there have been all of these just rebellions breaking up. People wanting a change. People wanting something new. In some cases, it's worked. In some cases, no. Is it a revolution? As I said before, I think taken as a whole, it's definitely a revolution. But individual cases, maybe not so. Just a few things about prospects of future, and I'll take questions. Uh, these are some of the things that I think we could, we could maybe see. Uh, first of all, uh, in some of these countries, maybe uh, possibly in Egypt, uh, Tunisia, possibly, in some of these other countries, we might see more of the same. We might see authoritarian leaders be, uh, be able to reestablish themselves uh, through the military. In many of these places, I think we'll see the military become a major arbiter in what happens. And it's going to be these generals who are going to decide whether there's going to be a democracy or whether there's going to be something else. Um, and they might have to make that kind of choice. Um, for democracy to work, uh, I see that the only way that they can, it can work is that corruption needs to be ended and that these patronage networks need to be destroyed. Otherwise, if they're still left in place, it's, it's just all going to be corrupt all over again and the people are going to suffer. And they're not going to, even though they might have freedom of speech, even though they might be voting for people, they're not going to get the real changes that they need. Um, I definitely see that there's going to be more potential for freedom. Much like the revolutions of 1848 in Europe allowed, um, especially the, the middle class or bourgeoisie, to have more say in government, I think that's going to happen here too. I think there's going to be people uh, being able to uh, participate in, in government more. I think there's going to be more freedoms of speech. Uh, another problem I see is that there's a real lack of leaders in these revolutions. There's no face to these revolutions. Has anybody, can you think of just one face? Can you think of one person? There is no real leaders to these revolutions. Okay? There are group efforts. There's many people participating in it, but there's no strong leader. There's no Nasser. 
There's no Mustafa Kemal Ataturk like from Turkey. There's no person who can, um, who can, I, I, that I've seen so far that can really take charge and create and mold a, a new democratic future for these countries. Now, maybe they'll come out, I hope. Another thing that really worries people, especially in the West, is the Islamist factor. Oh, Muslim um, Islamists, Muslims who, uh, Muslim um, revolutionaries who want to bring Islamic government to the Middle East, they're all behind all of this, or they're the ones who are going to benefit most from this. That's actually fear-mongering, and the Western press, especially Western media here, love this. And indeed, there are groups who are going to be Islamists. The Muslim Brotherhood is a very strong group in Egypt, for example. They can count on probably support from 20 to 30 percent of the entire population. Okay. But <clears throat> their power is, only, is greatly limited to probably institute some kind of Islamist government, to create a Sharia state or a caliph or anything like that. For the most part, these Islamists are going to participate in the political process. In Egypt, I've seen the Muslim Brotherhood, they want to participate in the political process. And if they're going to participate in democracy, if they're going to participate, they're going to have to moderate what they want. They're going to have to work within the system. And by virtue of them working in the system, their radical demands are going to diminish. Just like in Turkey. Turkey is run by an Islamist political party right now. Okay? It's called the AK Party. And they've totally, they're very... They've, they've very much moderated their whole radical stance on, on many of the, the you know, their, their, that they originally wanted to do. So I think that same thing is going to happen in, 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 the, if, in countries that, that do uh, work with or create democracies, is that these people will be part of the process, but they're not going to be, this, they're not going to get, be able to be the whole solution. Finally, there's going to be a need for economic reforms and development. Again, they're going to have to address unemployment. These governments are going to have to start using money to invest in um, jobs. Um, these governments are going to have to figure out a way to create, uh, over the next 10 to 15 years, 40 or 50 million new jobs uh, through development. I am not sure how they're going to be able to do that. But they're going to have to do that in order to get people employed, to make them happy. Otherwise, you know, these things are just going to keep going. So they've got to address unemployment. Uh, they have to get the funds. They have to redirect funds. And it might be really painful early on. For example, in Egypt, uh, about 5 million people uh, out of a, a population of about 65 million work for the government. Almost 10% of the population work for the government. And um, that's going to have to end. It's going to be really horrible for a lot of these people because they're going to be unemployed, at least early on. But they're going to have to figure out uh, private sector jobs for these people, or else um, these same situations are going to keep going on. <clears throat> There's going to have to be a, a toning down of the military and a reforming of these bureaucracies. They're going to have to be more responsive to the people. And the military eventually is going to have to not play a role in politics. Corruption is going to have to be taken care of, as I said. And finally, there's going to be a great need for foreign investment. I think that if these revolutions do take hold and we have more democratic governments appear in Tunisia and Egypt and elsewhere, the international community is going to have to step up and um, the IMF and others are going to have to start investing in these countries to give them futures. Also, these rentier states, the oil producers like Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, Qatar, and others, they're going to have to use their money as well. Uh, to invest in these countries. It, and it would be in their own interest to do that, have stability all around them. All right, that's it. So, questions? Yes, David. <clears throat> you have set out, uh, as you of course have to, the Sunni Shia distinction. Yes. Uh, I'm interested in the institutional role of the mosques and the imams. Mm -hmm. How do they fit Okay, a good question. In, in um, most of the Islamic world, um, you really uh, do not have uh, um, the... In most of the Islamic world, the uh, mosques and the imams are not uh, what we'd say part of the government. Uh, rather, rather, it's, it's a kind of an unofficial network. 
it, there's not really, it's not really well organized. Now, in Iran, it is. There's definitely a hierarchy there. In most of these countries, I would say that, that there, there's not really um, a, a need for the government to, to say, so, you know, uh, what would say, institutionalize these organizations. To, um, so you're basically asking, should they secularize these countries? They do have a role in, in organizing these, these, uh, some of these rebellions. Um, the mosques, um, Friday has been a traditional day of, uh, of, for these protests. And Friday, of course, is the uh, religious holiday for Muslims. And mosques, for example, in Syria have been um, the only place where people could gather without the government um, shooting at them. And so um, they do play a role. They have been playing a role in the, in the, um, in the uprisings. Yes? If a rebellion is successful, then it's, it's kind of a revolution, isn't it, sometimes? Or... If it's transformatory, yeah. As, as Professor McLeod was saying, it's transformatory, yes. Um, for example, in, in, in Libya, the, organ, the group that's organized, quote unquote, that says they represent the revolution there, they want to go back to the 1952 Constitution. So I don't know if that's really what you would call revolutionary. The rebellion is just the lashing out of authority. It doesn't necessarily mean change. Right. I have one more question. Right. Where do you see Israel in the... Oh, good question. Um, you know, the United States and Israel right now, um, the, you know, their heads are, are people at our State Department right now who are involved in Middle East affairs. Their heads are spinning. There's just so much going on so quickly, and they cannot really have, keep a handle on it. And Israel, too. Um, I think Israeli policymakers um, can't really decide what you know what they can do until things calm down. They're not too happy with the new regime in Egypt, for example. The new regime in Egypt um, has decided to go uh, opposite, really, of what Mubarak and to keep a, a good relationship with Israel. Um, and so, for example, they've decided to open up the border crossings between uh, Egypt and Gaza with no controls over it anymore. They're just going to open up the borders again. Um, and they're not going to cooperate with the Israelis uh, nearly as much. Um, also, Egypt's going to start to try to put, uh, to um, reach out to its uh, Arab neighbors more uh, and get away from its relationship with Israel. So I think for Israel, it has to worry about Egypt. Um, I think Israel also has to really worry about um, uh, Syria as well. Um, on one hand, probably the Israelis are happy would be happy to see Assad stay in power because they know him and they know what he you know he's, he his his mentality is. Um, on the other side, they might be happy for him to fall because uh, uh, Syria has been um, a proxy in helping Iran get influence in, into this region, and especially in supplying Hezbollah um, in, in Lebanon. If that network is broken up, if Syria were to have a regime change, then um, you know, uh, Hezbollah might not have that direct, inf uh, that direct connection with it, or as a direct connection with Iran anymore. So Israel might be happy about that. So you know they're kind of their heads are kind of spinning right now. They need to wait and see everything for us. So, and they, they're even now even more concerned with the rapprochement between Hamas and and the uh, and Fatah. Do you have a? I, I just wanted to just uh, support the statement about transfer to, transformation. When there um, is a real revolution, it means a total change in the government structure. Uh, and philosophy, and he brought up the idea of ideology, but the, the structure of the government. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not really happening in, in Egypt. I mean, there's this Mubarak uh, is gone, uh, but the military is there, and it's the same structure it was before. Mm -hmm. uh, They're going to make changes to the Constitution, but not a new one. Uh, yeah, here we go. Uh, and and uh, we're going to see who really is going to have any voice in there. Yes, and so, uh, you know, We'll see in the next uh, uh, next six to eight months what, what the military decides to do. Um, the military has not been happy with the protesters too. They've they've cracked down um, on protesters recently, and they they're keeping Tahrir Square, for example, clear as most protests, large ones. I want China. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'd like to ask you why do you think, especially in in Egypt, but not only, that the the culture of the uh, Egyptian. 
uh, that is the majority of the culture of the Egyptians, uh, so are so loyal to the military. Even though the military uh, is just totally uh, exploiting them. Yeah, they, why, why do they right. accept that again and again and again? That's a good question. Um, and remember I was talking about pow uh, power networks. The military actually is probably, uh, has more invested in the economy than anybody else. Right. And they, they don't, have, they have all the money, right? yeah, they have all the money. They own a lot of major industries as right. well. When, right. you know, and the same in Turkey too. The Turkey, you know, when you retire as a general, you become a chairman of the board of a company. Right. And the same thing in Egypt. So they have vested interest as they, they don't want to see this whole edifice. That's why they were, you know, let's jettison Mubarak. Right. We have too much to lose. Mm -hmm. um, when it comes to the uh, military, the people view the military through these, you know, their historical eyes going back to Nasser. Even though a majority of people out in Tahrir Square were never alive when Nasser was alive, because he died in 1970, most of those people never even knew Nasser. But there was the aura of him as this great liberator, as this person who just completely transformed society through, the, through him and the military. And they still believe that, though not all. Some people are starting to you know, get a little bit wise to this. But many others see that the only transformative uh, power that could be there is the military. They're the only ones that can do it. So um, yeah, they believe in that. Do you think that those that are uh, less loyal to the, uh, the military are more sic uh, sectarian in their views? Um, Actually, I would say that the um, in or secular, secular, Sec yeah, well, yeah, secular. The people loyal to the military are definitely uh, more secular. Um, there is also a large Christian community in Egypt too, which I didn't mention because that was one of the things that also sparked protests mm -hmm. was the uh, burning of a Christian church. Right. Um, what was really surprising is that for the most part, with the, the demonstrators, they were all saying we're all Egyptians, mm -hmm. uh, and they were looking past the religious divides. Um, well, many of the Islamists are not, you know, that they're, some of the radical Islamists have been the ones who have been, you know, um, putting pressure on, on Christian groups uh, in the country. Um, and I think that's a really interesting dynamic there with that, is what's the future of the Christian uh, Christians? And they, they put their hope and faith in the military as well to protect them. They don't want to see them go. Yes? Um, you mentioned that a, a lack of recognizable public basis for these revolutions. Um, what would you say to the argument that, given the temptations, once you're a charismatic leader, to just take over the exact same reins of corruption that's already been so nicely set up, yes. maybe, um, that this is a good thing that, that we don't have this? That's, that's, always, that's always been the case, actually. I, I mean, it's always the case. Uh, Ataturk is an, is an example of, he was an authoritarian leader who put into place a, a, um, a, a democratic or a republic, a democratic system. But yeah, you're right, the power corrupts and, and that's one of the risks that these people would take, uh, or that, you know, that they would take by putting their uh, faith in one leader. But then again, you know, there's, there's, there's a whole argument about um, it, it's often necessary to have uh, a strong central figure to keep all of these various groups. Because remember, all these rebellions, all these people are not on the same page. They all don't want the same thing. They all have different wants and needs. I mean, there's some overlying things like food and uh, an end to corruption and, and, um, and freedom of speech. But then there's all these individualistic needs too, like in Yemen. You know, our tribe wants this, or our religion wants this, or we want that. Uh, so to manage all those different viewpoints, often there is this view that you need to have a strong leader to, to juggle all those viewpoints. So that's, that's the, all I can really say to that. Sam? Yeah, I didn't hear anything about the variable or factor as contributing factor, I mean, uh, by WikiLeaks. I mean, WikiLeaks, uh, when it was released uh, in Tunisia, people saw the corruption of Ben Ali family. Yes. And that was before that incident that they beat that guy in the vendor. <laughs> and then Dick in Yemen played a big role. That, that People found out that, you know, uh, Saleh uh, jokes after he leaves the cabinet, you know, he tells people, I went there and lied that, you know, that I 
did this and this and this. Uh, so people saw through all of these things. So WikiLeaks has played a role. I mean, no, that's a good point. He, Sam's very right. I, I should put that on there because I, I forgot about that. I should put that in, a, in there. But yeah, and part of it, and that's, I don't know how we would, we can't qualify that as part of social media, but we can say that WikiLeaks did play a really big role in, in uh, exposing these. You're right, especially with, uh, with uh, Yemen and, um, and, uh, and, um, and Tunisia. That's a very good point, Sam. For the everybody speaks uh, for the most part, as I said in the beginning, uh, Arabic is the is the primary language used in the Middle East, um, except for Israel, of course. Um, but uh, Arabic has regional variations in, uh, in, uh, in or dialects that make um, some communication a little more difficult because words mean certain different things or or there are different pronunciations. So they're regional. There's Gulf Arabic, and there's uh, North African Arabic, there's Egyptian Arabic, Syrian Arabic, Iraqi Arabic. It's, they're a little bit different. In Iran, of course, uh, Persian is the predominant language, or Farsi. And there's an idea that I, I haven't read about, and I don't know that it's somebody hasn't written, I just don't know, um, that uh, it, <clears throat> the, there's a very, it's very revolutionary. Revolutionary, I think the word applies in the Middle East that people are looking at and considering democracy, mm -hmm. because uh, traditionally, historically, nearly all of that land uh, has been led, even proudly led, uh, pried by the people in, in what I've, I've called and I've read is a big dog mentality. In other words, the big dog is the guy that's respected. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a tribal concept. Uh, and it goes back as far as back can be gone in history. Yes. So the the idea of of people really seriously looking at democracy mm -hmm. and demanding it uh, is indeed revolutionary. Mm -hmm. I, I think the word is appropriate. Um, now, this may sound terribly controversial, and I realize that there's been no talk about this. But when the United States went into uh, Iraq. Uh, and at, when it went into Afghanistan, also the same effort, was to create a democracy, was to create democracies. And I wonder how the Middle Eastern mind, such a thing doesn't exist as such, I realize, but uh, people have tried writing been, books about been that. chewing on this for 10 years, right. watching the experiment in a real democracy, uh -huh. uh, other than Israel, because they won't look at Israel mm -hmm. as a true democracy. Um, that this could work. It could work in Egypt. It could work in Tunisia. It could work in uh, Libya. And, and I just, I, I'm just curious if there isn't an, in, you know, if it's ever occurred uh, in, in your own thinking that the United States has had a role, uh, not necessarily intentionally, in the observation of the Middle East, the people of the Middle East around. Yes. A couple things, yeah. Number one, you, you're, uh, you're right about the whole looking at uh, avenues of authority uh, and the, this, this big dog mentality. As you, you said. That's very much, and when I say, oh, you need to get rid of these old traditional networks to have a really good democracy, by saying that, I'm almost saying something that's impossible to do. Yes. I'm being very optimistic. Um, but um, when it comes to democracy, I, I think definitely if we look at the history all the way back, going back to the end of World War I, the United States, um, and even before World War I, in our educational outreach to the Middle East through missionaries, um, we, have, we have promoted the idea of democracy. And, um, and uh, I think the uh, promotion of it has worn off on the, on the people there. I mean, we, we can see it. Um, we can see it in, in even the pronouncements uh, of people after World War One, you know, saying, "Hey, we we want to have a country. We want to have a democracy. We want the United States to maybe, you know, look over us until we we can do it." Instead, they got the British and the French, unfortunately. Right. But you're right. That's that is something that is that is uh, influenced. Now, I think our I think we've terribly compromised ourselves in the creation of the democracy in Iraq, because it really, we have elections there, they have elections, they have a democracy, quote unquote, uh, but 
all of these networks of uh, these networks of corruption are, are it's most one of the most corrupt countries in the world. We didn't get rid of that, and um, we replaced one authoritarian group, the Sunnis, with a, an authoritarian group, the Shia now. And um, when there were uprisings too in, in Iraq at the same time, and the Maliki government just you know brought in the police and, and cracked heads. And they too were uh, had the same problems. They were um, they were uh, they were protesting against corruption. They were protesting against food prices, um, and um, they wanted more fuller democracy. And the Maliki government doesn't want to do that. And this, you know we also have the issues with, with northern Iraq. The Kurds have, have their own authoritarian style state there, run by Barzani. So yeah, it hasn't really worked out as I think we hope. And of course, I don't want to go with Afghanistan. Yeah, my own. My own thought on that is that would explain why uh, these rebel groups are not looking to the United States. They're not. They're not. Yeah. From what I see from the people who are uh, who are demanding democracies, um, I think they are. I think they're more and more. Um, uh, how should I say? Emphasizing nationalism as a as a unifying factor. In Yemen, for example. Um, a lot of people in the crowds are not saying, oh, we're from this tribe or that tribe or north or south, we're Yemenis. And we'll solve our own problems through our, our, a government that we elect. So I think, I think that nationalism might be one of the ways that they could um, try or at least work to, you know, it hasn't worked in Iraq. It never worked in Iraq. Um, it's working, actually, uh, just one more point with Lebanon. Uh, Lebanon has that same problem. You know, it's sectarianly, it's even the most divisive sectarian-wise. Um, there have also been demonstrations there as well, huge ones. And what are their demonstrations about? We're, uh, we want a secular government and we're all Lebanese and mm -hmm. who cares about what we come from? We're not going to listen to our religious bosses anymore. Okay? That's what some of them are saying. Not everybody. Hezbollah doesn't like that idea. I think that if we want to see more stability, that there that the international community does have to come up with some sort of way of um, of helping if these regimes do indeed change, if these constitutions do, uh, if they do in place put in place constitutions, and if they want to see these countries not fail, um, they indeed will need to do something um, because they're, they're otherwise they're just going to be crushed under the same economic malaise. Um, as I said, though, the corruption is a huge factor um, that they have to alleviate too, because the IMF, um, uh, the IMF for one, doesn't want to give money that will just go in the pockets of a lot of people at the top. The, the best way that we could that we could um, end the influence of radical Islamists is to uh, is to give the youth uh, a future, because then they'll re they'll reject this every time. It, it, it's really a lot of people turn to Islam, a radical Islamist groups like Al Qaeda because they um, either they've been brainwashed ideologically or they just don't see a future and they this this will give them something. Uh, when we talk about nation nation states, nation states are a relatively new thing to the Middle East. Um, they were created really um, after uh, World War One and World War Two. Um, but yes, there are many nation states, and, and um, whether people. Uh, I, Identify with their nation state is another thing. In Iraq, for example, uh, if you were to ask a lot of people, more people identify either with their religious identity or their regional identity. Uh, and that's a problem in Lebanon as well um, and, and many other countries. But yes, they're mostly organized, everybody's organized into nation states. All right. Thank you very much.